President Ravi Kundar and President-elect Ingrid Rubains. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here, although as University of Cape Town Vice-Chancellor, on behalf also of the Vice-Chancellors of the University of the Free State, uh, Francis Peterson, who will be here for some of the meeting, uh, the University of the Western Cape, uh, and also the HSRC. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure on behalf of the four of us to welcome you to this conference, to welcome you to Cape Town. If this is your first time in Cape Town, I hope you'll have some time to uh, explore the beauty of the city. Uh, and also to say something about the venue, because we would have wanted to welcome you to the physical venue of the University of Cape Town. It is, I thought we won the bid because it's the most beautiful university in the world, uh, and you would have uh, really done yourself a disservice if you don't take a bit of time to drive through the upper campus uh, and, and see how beautiful it is. But I make that point not only to boast about the university, but to comment on the fact that we're having uh, a conference on inequality in a five-star hotel in downtown Cape Town. And that that must make, that ought to make us feel a little uncomfortable and a little awkward uh, and need some justification. And it's just to say that the intention was to hold the conference at the University of Cape Town on our campus, um, but uh, because of a series of protest activities last year, when we, uh, we, we ended up having to delay our academic year and start a, a month late, and the time that would have been available, this time when venues would have been available, we are in fact in, in full, fl full flow with uh, normal teaching and we could not accommodate a conference of 350 people on the campus. So that's our, our collective apology. Uh, no doubt this will be comfortable and you will enjoy it, uh, but we should be thinking about that context too. The theme, challenging inequalities in human development and social change, clearly appropriate because it's the core business of what you all think about uh, as in the association. Appropriate to be having the conference for the first time on African soil. And perhaps also appropriate that it's at this moment in South Africa's history because it's a, particular, a particularly uncomfortable and distressing moment for us. Uh, at 22, 23 years after the democratic change, just two weeks ago, the uh, Statistics South Africa, our national statistics uh, organization, published a report on poverty trends in South Africa, an examination of absolute poverty between 2006 and 2015, so reflecting the last decade of what has been happening uh, at a time when we have been investing heavily in social grants, in a range of public works and infrastructure projects, in expanding water and electrification, in housing programs, in doing all the things that we think should be doing to improve not just the social wage, investing in schools and universities, and not just the social wage, but in fact also uh, the, the, the financial, the, the take-home wage. And yet, this report tells us, bluntly, that 30.4 million out of 55 million citizens in South Africa in 2015, this is 55% of our citizens, are living in, uh, are, are, are living in poverty, below what, is what we call the upper poverty line, those of you South African may know that that's 992 rand per person per month. For the international guests, that's about $2.50 a day. So we call that the upper poverty line and about 55% of, of, of our citizens are living below that up, upper poverty line. But more distressing than that is that that figure is 3 million more than it was 10 years ago. Uh, up until this report, most of us thought or, or the statistics, the data was telling us that poverty had declined, and certainly it has declined since 2004, uh, since 1994. So let me just highlight the point that there was a significant improvement from 94 to 2005, uh, and it's particularly in the last five years that we've seen the drop. So we're better off than 94, but in the last 10 years, uh, the number of people in poverty has increased. Before that, the statistics were telling us that the number of people in poverty had decreased although inequality had increased. And there was that tension of saying, well, in a sense, what's more important? Isn't it better to get everyone out of absolute poverty, um, even if it means some people are rising faster and inequality is increasing? 
But here we have a report that's telling us that, inequality, that poverty itself has increased. And that's a, a real body blow to us. Uh, of course, as you might expect, more women are affected than men, and more, more children and elderly are affected. And then, also not surprisingly, the racial inequalities continue to define the poverty divides. That doesn't mean that there aren't a whole lot of a whole lot more black people who are middle class and upper class than there were before. And if you just look at the class, at the racial makeup of, of, of the elite, that is much more diverse than it was before, much more non much more deracialized, but the poor are still black. And that's what and that's that's clearly uh, the issue. If we adopt the capabilities approach to poverty defined by Amartya Sen as and I'm quoting the deprivation of basic capabilities rather than merely as lowness of incomes impacting on the substantive freedoms of, that people have to lead the lives and kinds of lives they value, unquote, then the numbers would be even more appalling given the expanded poverty-related problems experienced by many communities in South Africa and particularly in rural parts of the country. Evidence from other studies such as the National Income Dynamics Study a nationally representative panel study which Sal Drew at UCT undertakes on behalf of the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in the Presidency. Evidence from that study shows that the lives of over 28,000 South Africans who have been tracked since 2008 that um, shows continued deprivations in health, education, safe and functional families and communities um, which undergird poverty and inequality and human capability. This is a, a comment on our failure to build an inclusive society. As a new democracy, we simply cannot continue to tolerate the lack of improvement in people's lives or only small incremental changes. And a conference like this is desperately needed to figure out why what we've been doing appears not to work, what new thinking there is, what new approaches there are, uh, what evidence there is for different policies um, and evidence for the failure of the policies we've had. I'm, I'm overstating it because, of course, there have been many policies that have worked and we mustn't, just, we mustn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Whilst across the continent, we clearly need to develop new ways of doing things to reduce the number of people in, affected by extreme poverty, we also need to focus on the people at the high end whose wealth and privileges ignite feelings of anger and resistance, particularly amongst the youth and the more marginalized sectors of our society, people who are incensed by the lack of progress in redressing inequalities in our society. In South Africa, whilst the anger is exacerbated by the justified deep concerns with state capture and corruption, this should not detract attention away from the multiple and structural inequalities of our society. I've mentioned um, the, uh, the, the challenges and looking through the program that we are, that you have, uh, it's really a, a stunning program and as you heard from the introduction of my own um, biography uh, or CV, these are all subjects that interest me deeply and I wish I could spend the whole week with you addressing and learning about these issues. There are exciting keynote addresses ahead. I've noted many examples of how marginalized communities in several countries in the global south are using capabilities and rights-based approaches in exercising their collective agency to imagine and strive for alternative ways of doing things and deconstructing their realities, as well as critical reflections on pioneering state policies related to things like public employment, education, food security, economic empowerment, uh, and healthcare, all of which are crucial for effect having an impact on the material differences in people's lives. There are papers dealing with the further development of the capabilities approach itself, methodological papers, uh, papers that uh, relate to capabilities in employment, and others that aim to deepen our understanding of the factors impacting on the perpetuation of inequalities. There are others that confront methodology and, uh, and the challenge of measuring uh, it given it within the framework of a human capability approach. It's really encouraging to see evidence of so many young scholars linking their scholarship to social justice issues. I have no doubt that over the next days you will engage with this new scholarship, new people and new perspectives. 
the conference will challenge all of us to think more deeply and creatively about the strategies to promote a more equal South Africa, a more sustainable and equitable African continent, and a more fair and just global social order. I congratulate the organizing committee and all of you for the quality and scope of this program, and I formally declare the conference open. So the conference was sobering, if I have to, have to summarize it. Um, in a sense, great progress has been made in thinking about these measures of, of people's lives uh, and the weaknesses of the measures. They don't tell the full story. You measure people's lives, but they actually, the, the reality of their lives is much more complicated. And it's the intersection of the measures. So you can measure their health or education status or their income status or how their communities, the crime rates in their communities, but it's all of those intersect to create a livelihood and policy is supposed to improve the livelihood. It's not, so, you know, the, improving the measure may not change the reality of somebody's life. And uh, to give you two examples from the keynotes in the conference, uh, Jayati Ghosh, a very eminent Indian scholar, spoke about the waste pickers of India uh, waste being human waste here, yeah. and uh, and it was a, a subtle and nuanced presentation about the fact that struggles have been had to to legislate protection for these these waste pickers. Uh, they don't have waterborne sewerage, so it's not it's not the South African context that we're thinking about here, yeah. or even the lose that there's been so much struggle over, you know, in the Western Cape. Um, they have human waste pickers who come around to the houses and, and the buildings and pick up the human waste. And, uh, and there's been many struggles to improve, the, to empower, protect these people. Not to change their livelihoods. Uh, the, the Indians don't quite know what to do about that. That would be the long run goal. This is not the type of job that you want your citizens to be doing. But for now, it's been to try and protect uh, these people. Many are women as well. Uh, and uh, and legislation has even been changed. But her story was such that, that there's a whole social relationship around these human waste pickers. They're from the lowest cost in India. Um, you can change legislation. It hasn't changed their power and their, the, the potential to abuse these, these waste pickers. Abuse them in what you pay, but abuse them in many, many dimensions of what they do. And so it was daunting. She ended her, her keynote by saying, until you address power, you, you're not going to be able to give full effect to this human development approach to, to changing policy. You can even change the policy, but if you don't change what's really going on around the policy, you haven't changed the livelihood. Very micro level. But it's true of many of the communities that we work with uh, in South Africa as well. Um, at the very aggregate level, Salim Jahan from the United Nations Development Program, who's been involved in, in the high level SDG process and measuring development for, for two decades. Uh, and he spoke about the same thing. We now have the SDGs in place. We're about to measure them. That could be a trap. It could actually turn out to be a deflection of, of attention away from actually helping people in their lived reality at the most high level. And so, uh, let me start again. So that could even be a trap, you know, it, it could get in the way and it could deflect attention away from helping people at the most high, uh, in their lived reality. In, in the sense that the SDGs are supposed to improve the livelihoods of people. So what they're unleashing right now is a storm of measurement. And it's a bit of a trap. Um, uh, Ravi Kanbur, one of the eminent conference participants, called it the new conditionality, where countries have to report and everybody's running around aligning these, these measures and aligning reporting. And it's the national statistical agencies that are center stage well, what about the policy processes? What about the changes in education? You know, what about the changes in health that are supposed to drive the changes in the indicators? We, we've moved so far away from the people and even changing the policies needs to be grounded on the people 
and the human capabilities approach, its very strength, is grounding itself in the lived reality of people. One of the key themes of the Sustainable Development Goals is uh, let no one be left behind. Um, and so that implies that, that, that you want to reach into the marginalized communities and, and empower them. But that approach to policy of reaching down almost to people, that going forward, that is our biggest challenge. We don't just want no one to be left behind, but we need to start with the last first in their lived reality and go from there. Build up from people, empowering them so that they can exercise their agency. This is a very daunting challenge given the structures in place. That's not how policy people think, uh, but even in our South African situation, we can completely understand that that's what communities are now demanding. They're irritated with policy people. They don't want policy to be just delivered. They want to partner with government in delivering their own uh, upliftment. Mm -hmm.